Uh, OK, so we're going to have six startups presenting in two blocks. The first one is going to be Unify ID. Presenting for Unify ID are John Whaley and Kurt Somerville. Welcome back to the stage, guys. You have six minutes. How do you identify people? Is it the way they look? Maybe you look at their face, their smile, their voice, their possessions, the places you see them. Once you know someone well enough, maybe you can recognize them by the way they walk or the way they move, the sound of their footsteps, their heartbeat. What is it that makes you, you? You're not a nine-digit number. You're not a piece of plastic with a photo on it. And you're certainly not a password with a capital letter, a number, and a symbol. I'm John Whaley, and this is Kurt Somerville, and we are the founders of Unify ID. And we are changing the way you authenticate yourself. We use biometric and behavioral factors to build a unique digital fingerprint of you and use that to authenticate and secure your identity. It's called implicit authentication, and it's going to revolutionize the way you authenticate yourself, both online and offline. Let me show you. So I have the Unify ID app installed on my phone, as well as on my computer. Now, once you install Unify ID, you don't need to deal with passwords or authentication again. Can we switch to the demo computer, please? Great. When you go to a website like Amazon.com, you click one button, and you're in. Unify ID uses the recent sensor data from your phone, computer, wearables, and other nearby devices. If the signals match, you're in. No passwords to remember, no codes to read off your phone, and no fuss. This is the future of authentication. Now, I'll hand my phone to Kurt. And he'll try to do the same thing. Kurt's going to walk over, sit down, and try to log in. Now, Kurt has my computer. He has my phone. He even knows my passcode, which, by the way, is 5555. Don't worry, that's the same passcode as over 6 million other Americans. Now, unfortunately for Kurt, the signals don't match, and Kurt is denied login. And if you look on my phone, I received a notification with details of the login attempt. Can we switch to the overhead projector, please? Perfect. Thank you. Now, how did that work? Well, you may have noticed both Kurt and I awkwardly walking across the stage. Right. That's because one of the factors we use to authenticate you is how you walk. Now, Kurt and I are the same height. We're the same build. In fact, we even have the same shoe size. And we seemingly walk the same. But the, the sensor data tells a different story. We can actually distinguish between my walking and Kurt's walking just from the phone in our pocket. Now let's take a look at some of the data from the keyboard. Again, we don't look at what you type. We look at how you type. And we can actually distinguish between my typing and Kurt's typing even after a few keystrokes. These are just two factors of over 100 different attributes that go into our proprietary machine learning system that automatically discovers what makes you unique. This spans from the way you move, to the places you go, to the signals from the devices around you. There's a lot of sophisticated signal processing and machine learning to make it all happen, but the result is magical. UnifyD has applications in streamlining authentication, reducing fraud, and preventing account takeover. Unlike other techniques, we use passive factors to identify the human behind the device. So we naturally work cross device, and we don't require any conscious user action. We're in private beta right now, and we're working with some of the top financial services and technology companies to evaluate and deploy Unify ID. Our solution has clear applicability to the $170 billion cybersecurity market and the $600 billion e-commerce market. Not only that, but we see this extending for offline use cases as well, for example, with IoT devices, which both have a need for security as well as are an additional source of sensor data. In the immediate term, one of our partners has a big problem with account takeover, and we're working with them to incorporate Unify ID's technology um, on their website and on their mobile app. 
another partner has a problem with password resets. Over 30% of their help desk calls are password reset calls. These are both problems we're solving for them immediately. We're a group of cybersecurity and machine learning experts from MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, and CMU, and we're out to fix authentication forever. My co-founder and I worked together at our previous enterprise security startup that got acquired last year. We have experience in selling to Fortune 500 and Global 2000 companies, and we understand what it takes to build and deploy real security solutions that directly touch end users. Humans have always been thought of as the weak link in security. At UnifyD, we're flipping that around and using what's unique about each individual to enhance security. We believe the best way to authenticate yourself is to be yourself. I'm John Whaley. We are UnifyD. Come to our website and sign up for our private beta so you too can experience the future of authentication. Thank you. All right, judges, who wants to start us off? Sure. Can you walk me through the uh, competitive landscape for basically who your competitors are? Oh, um, so a lot of people are trying to own own your identity. I mean, uh, there's, so there's 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 big companies and small companies. I mean, the big four: Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Microsoft. Microsoft. You know, they all have their own notion of owning identity. I mean, if you go to Facebook, it's, they want uh, Facebook wants you to use your Facebook account as your identity. Right. And ultimately, I mean, we believe that none of those four are going to actually ever be the ones to win out because, you know, they're all competitive with each other. And it's, you know, it's unlikely that you'll be able to log into Apple using your Facebook, using your Facebook account pretty soon or, or Google or any of those. Right. And so and then um, on the smaller side, you know, on the, the startup side, there are a lot of startups doing a lot of really interesting technologies. But most of them are around individual factors, you know, things like fingerprint or palm print or iris scan or these type of things. We strongly believe that you know, there's no single, single silver bullet factor. And so we're, we're completely agnostic to all, all of those, you know, all the different factors. The ones we're focusing on are the ones that are, are passive and are going to be a good user experience. And so we act, the, our IP is actually around the, the back end, you know, the, uh, the machine learning algorithms that we use to combine many of these very noisy factors into a single, uh, a single score that, that gives you a high level of confidence. So I, think um, I have a question. Um, my first question is, how do you federate between different environments? So you're using, I'm using Unify ID in one environment, and I have a different password in the e-commerce example, for example, uh, from the credit company to my account in Amazon or whatever. So that's one question. Second question is, if you're using sensors from smartphones as one of the input, what happens if that input is not there, if I'm trying to log in without my cell phone? Okay. Yeah. So the so the, the first question is um, uh, so how do we handle like you know this fed, this this idea of like a federated identity and um, so at our previous startup as well we had a lot of experience in implementing both sides of many different types of protocols um, you know all the way from things like username and password uh, you know to using things like uh, like SAML or you know the or OAuth or you know all sorts you know Radius protocol RSA Secure ID number of these and so. Ultimately, um, you know, we uh, we have APIs to uh, to hook into those. Now, um, uh, on, on the second the second part of your question about the sensors, so um, the, the way that the machine learning works is that we don't always have access to all of the sensors. I mean, the type of sensors that we use are you know the, the sensors available on on your phone, um, wearables if you have them, and on the, your computer if you have them. Now, uh, there's various cases where you don't have all the sensor data. You know. Um, one thing that's very important to us is, is on the privacy side, and so we want to make sure that, that there's a lot of transparency as well as control, or, you know, or control by the end user about what data that they share. Right. So um, you can actually turn off individual factors, and then the machine learning automatically reweights uh, the factors to take that in, into account. So even if you have missing data from certain factors, then what happens is the, then you you end up with a higher false negative rate, and so the false negative rate in, in our context means you get challenged in some way. The type of challenge we have are these type of active challenge to, challenges to prove your identity, things like you know fingerprints, facial recognition. We have a few other in, in development as well. Um, and but but what happens is as you use the system, um, then in the common cases uh, it begins to to recognize you and not challenge you. Um, and then once uh, after about a week of time, we hit a very very high level of accuracy, and it actually and then it, it peaks out, it plateaus around four weeks of and once we have about four weeks of data. So 
I think you were addressing a, a problem that every single person in this audience can identify right. with. Yeah. My question is really a business question around your go to market. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> as I listened to you, I, I thought about whether you want to aim at a consumer business or an enterprise business. Do you want to have a bottoms up adoption approach with a freemium business model? Are you going to do a top down sale? Because account takeover and social engineering are huge issues in security. So, how do you think about these different decisions you make about go to market? So, you know, um, I mean, I have to call out the, the security, the security industry in general, like the way that people, the way that security companies currently sell security, because it's really, it's a lot of FUD, it's a lot of, you know, fear, uncertainty, and, that, and doubt, and that's the way that they sell their solutions. And for too long, security has been about, you know, about fear, about passwords, about encryption, about these, you know, these type of things. If you look at, if you look at identity and authentication, I mean, ultimately, it's a, it's a very human problem. I mean, it's, it's, you know, identifying who is the person behind the device. Um, and so just too, too often, um, vendors don't take into account the user experience. And so that, that is really, that's really one of our key differentiators. About, and that's why we, we went out to set up to solve this problem and are using pa things like passive factors, implicit authentication, to be able to go after this. So the user experience is, is extremely key. Now, you, uh, individuals do not pay for security. I mean, this, uh, like, there, there, are no, there are no users that's, that, that would want to pay for something like this. Well, maybe, perhaps some, but individuals don't pay for this, right? Ultimately, the, the cost for fraud and account takeover is borne by the organizations. And so, I mean, all, what, what we're doing is we're building this technology that, that can identify people without them having to make any, any conscious actions. And there is a huge, there's a massive opportunity for, for this kind of system. But you still have a lot of decisions to make about whether you're going to have a consumer business where you grow bottom up and you sell to banks and some of the e-commerce sites that you alluded to to have a top-down sale, or do you go to enterprises and you partner with you know, the single sign-on vendors and, and it's more of an enterprise security focus? I mean, those are two big decisions you need to make. So, yeah, I mean, so at this point, like, we are, we're singularly focused on um, acquiring, acquiring more users and acquiring additional user data because that's what's going to allow us to improve the machine learning models, prove out the technology, right? And so... Um, we, we do have the, the Chrome extension and the mobile app. You can actually uh, sign up and download on our, on our website, but ultimately we don't make money from that. That's really a technology showcase. And um, we're, we're firm uh, believers that consumers need this technology. Um, we're, we're, we're crossing an invisible line where you know, this, is, this is new type of personal data, and we believe that that data should be owned by the user and controlled. So uh, okay. if you want to purge that data, you can do so. Uh, that data lives on your device. Uh, we don't see any of the, the raw data. We don't do any streaming data to our back end. Um, so it's, it's really focused on, on user data and user privacy. Yeah, but I mean, ultimately in the near term, there's, uh, I mean, we're working with a few partners today who have very clear issues with having to identify the human behind the device, and they have a very clear business case. And so these are the partners we're working with today in order to gain traction. So the, the answer to this question seems to be you're going to be, you're going to sell to companies because users don't pay, it's hard to acquire them on an individual basis. Yes. And in the end, you need to solve those problems that companies have at scale, right? That's, that's so right. Any, any type of user community that requires a high amount of security without sacrificing user experience, that's, okay. where, that's where we specialize in. Right, so I have two questions. One, how do you convince these companies that their own authorization systems like Touch ID or Amazon sign in everywhere, talk to your Echo, we, see, we know your voice, you know, all of that stuff is not the right way to go instead? To like, in other words, to cross silos with another company, sure. with mm -hmm. some external vendor, right? Yep. Uh, and you're not a consortium, you're not a government-backed you know, agency or whatever. Uh -huh. And then the second question is, how do you seed the data? So I know those are wildly different, but the first one is probably, probably good. Well, we know how IT solutions are sold in the enterprise and that there's very long sales cycles and that some, some uh, decision maker in that organization made a uh, decision to install a certain system. And that person's not going to just rip it out in replacement for ours. So we're working to basically integrate these existing security features into our own. And so for like RSA Secure ID, we would just use that as a second factor in our system. Uh, so we would only require that if our confidence level wasn't high enough that it's you. So then you would do the second factor. Yeah, right. and so in, in the near term, I mean, the, we, um, we're we using this in, in conjunction with other factors to include, you know, increase security. Because a lot of organizations are not yet comfortable with this idea of completely eliminating passwords. Now, we strongly believe that even within a few years, the password alone is no longer going to be the predominant method of authentication. 
you know. And if you think about what's going to win out, it's not going to be a text message to your phone. It's not going to be something extra you carry around. You know, it's going to be using these type of implicit authentication. Uh, you know, these type of passive factors. I mean, it's been too long that that security. You know, that that individuals have had have had to change their behavior. You know, to to match technology. I think it's about time that technology. Um, now, actually, went and tried to fit the, the user behavior because changing user behavior is very, very hard. I mean, everybody knows, everyone knows that they have to have better passwords. Everyone knows that, you know, adding a second factor improves security. Everybody knows that, and still, you know, you look at the, the you look at the passwords that people are actually using. You look at the the, the actual deployment of you know two-factor authentication. You know, um, it's uh, it's very, very low. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, so how are you going to store all the data, all those biometric data, to make sure that no one breaks in? Because you ever did have a break in here, and that data wasn't stored securely, all passwords of potentially large set of people would be lost, and that would put the whole system at risk. Yeah, so um, so we we understand the security side very well. So I I got my PhD at Stanford. My my PhD research my my thesis was in program analysis and security and machine learning. And so we understand very much how to do this right. And most people don't do this right. Uh, so we we use you know techniques like client side encryption, and we use differential privacy, and we use like a number of other techniques so that the raw data first of, first of all never leaves the local device. So it's processed on the local device, and we extract feature vectors, and then those get sent up to a machine learning system that that uses those to automatically discover what makes you unique. And uh, so none of the raw data ever leaves the ever leaves the device, and. Uh, and we design it in the way we're assuming that our servers are going to be compromised. And so we just try to minimize the exposure when the servers are compromised. So things like all the, because all the encryption happens on the local device, even if we get subpoenaed or, you know, or anything like that, then, then we, uh, we, can, we can't even read this, the secrets either. Can you tell if someone's under duress? Excuse me? I, if someone's under duress, can you tell? Uh, Potentially, yeah. I mean, we uh, we, have to, we we haven't done those tests yet, but uh, yeah, there are, there are very unique, um, you know, these biometric fingerprints of you know of how you of how you behave, right? Um, the other important factor is that many of these are quite noisy. So I mean, you know, when we're walking across the stage here, I mean, this you know, if depending on what type of shoes you're wearing, uh, that can actually be different. We can actually exactly quantify, very precisely quantify, you know, high heels versus not high heels, and how that affects your cadence and other aspects to your gait. But the, um, there are a number of cases where, where it's each individual factor it doesn't match, um, you know, and that's why you have to use many different factors together. Combination. And, and, and we, we very strongly believe that this is, you know, there is no single bullet, single bullet, you know, silver bullet factor. You know, fingerprints are great except for the fact you leave them everywhere you go, and they are very, very hard to change. <laughs> and uh, and you know, likewise with you know, doing taking a selfie. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of places where it's not appropriate to take a selfie. You know, there's every single one of these factors. You know, they all have their pros and cons, and so that's why we strongly believe that the, in the future it's gonna you're gonna have to get it's gonna be yes I'm gonna use fingerprint yes I'm gonna use facial recognition yes we're gonna use gate analysis yes we're gonna use telemetry from Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and these other signals but ultimately the, f the factors that are gonna win out are gonna be the ones that are passive that don't require changes in user behavior and additional friction in the user experience. It's right, literally we're... just being yourself. Yeah. All right, we're out of time. So give it up one more time for Unify ID. All right. Thank you. It's good. They brought some fans. Excellent. <laughs> uh, okay.